Nanotechnology is often presented as a potential solution to a wide range of problems and an area where the UK in particular can hope to excel. But it's such a broad term that it can be hard to pin down exactly what it refers to. I visited the London Centre for Nanotechnology to try to get a better understanding of what its study involves and what it could be used for. Okay, so I'm Marla Schaffer and I'm one of the two co-directors of the London Centre for Nanotechnology. Uh, it's a joint venture between Imperial College and University College. I mean, there are a number of different problems that you, or different parts to uh, nanotechnology which you have to uh, have, if you like. So one part is the synthesis or fabrication of the nanoscale structure. So you need very good control of uh, the structure that you make. The next part is characterization of the structure, which I've been talking about in terms of the microscopy and some of the uh, ion imaging. Uh, then, of course, you need the uh, performance data in, in the kind of application that you're interested in and to understand how it works, uh, or, or which might, might be an application or it might be uh, a new phenomenon. So understanding your scientific behaviour, so you've still got to measure what the behaviour is and understand where it comes from. And then there's another part, which is, um, if you like, theory, computation and modelling uh, in order to uh, elucidate those mechanisms involved and perhaps to redesign the structure or to make predictions about what kind of composition you should be trying to make. When you're studying things on the nano scale, you need machines to enable you to see them. And that's the first place that engineers come in. This is a Titan electron microscope that allows scientists to study materials right down to the atomic level. The London Centre for Nanotechnology has several very rare instruments, and even some that are unique in the world. My name is um, Sarah Fern, and I'm a research fellow in charge of the Sims Lysis instrumentation. Um, and so the Sims Lysis instrument is here, um, and it's actually a combined instrument um, with a top Sims, which is a time of light secondary ion mass spectrometer, and um, a low energy ion scatterer. Um, this instrument being combined um, is actually unique in the world. Um, SIMS has existed um, for 30 to 40 odd years now, but recently Eintop have introduced um, the LICE instrumentation and we now have, we had chose to have the two instruments placed together so that we could actually carry out um, very, very near surface measurements in situ um, with then composition and analysis, which is what the SIMS allows us to do. Um, what we've been using it for and what we're hoping to use it for are um, fuel cell applications. Um, at this point, in this um, application, it's very important to know how, um, in our case, looking at cathodes, how oxygens actually go from the atmosphere or the air that's next to the surrounding oxide and transfers into the material. And that's a, an atomic glare process we need to know about. Um, to that end, we actually need to know what that final termination surface is so that the models can actually be made to work out how, theoretically, what the process should be as well. Developing more useful materials is one clear application for nanotechnology, but one of its big appeals is that it is interdisciplinary. Um, if you think about why it's attracted so much attention and enthusiasm, it's really because it uh, combines uh, so many different uh, exciting areas of science. So on the one hand, it's been very much driven by top-down um, assembly in microelectronics, so carving ever finer structures, more detailed structures, the kind of thing that's given us ever increasing computing power over the last few decades. Um, but it's also driven by bottom-up kinds of assembly that we're developing in chemistry, whereas you, we gradually build more and more complicated structures by bringing different uh, molecules together, designing more complicated molecules, getting them to assemble themselves and so on. And so we get to the stage where what we can assemble from the bottom-up is um, interacting or beginning to be on the same length scale as what you can carve from the top down. Um, and that length scale is the nanoscale. So for most people it's very small of course, but for chemists it's actually quite large. Um, and that same length scale then is quite interesting from a biological point of view because it interacts with a lot of different biological sorts of systems and processes that might be going, let's say, on enzymes or um, membranes or that kind of uh, thing. Um, so as these different fields uh, collide, they have to, well, they've begun to share common problems, at least in terms of trying to understand what's going on uh, and to um, develop common tools which allow them to uh, study the problems that they have and to develop solutions which they can share as well, so from one, one particular application to another. 